This begins with David Pawson reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 23. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in his love to be his sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, according to the counsel of his will, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory, in him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe? According to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I don't profess to begin to understand the depths of that passage. It flows like a mighty river. And in fact, Paul doesn't even punctuate his sentences. It's just one long sentence pouring out of his mouth as his heart thinks of the amazing purpose of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, to think that you planned all this before you made the world, that you knew it was going to be necessary to send your Son, that you knew even then that we should be part of your church now, to think that you planned our future for us even before we were born. And through the many years that we did not know Jesus Christ, you were planning a place in heaven just for us. Lord, we are lost in wonder, love, and praise. And that you should tell us all about this and reveal the mystery and make known the secret and tell us all that you have prepared for those who love you and that we can look forward confidently to this. Lord, we marvel at your love for us when you know so much about us. There are some people, the more they know about us, the less they love us. But you know everything, and you love us enough to send your Son. 
Father, we praise you for your patience with us. If we'd been you, we'd have held the day of judgment long ago. We'd have dissolved this world in fire long ago. And yet you have allowed this day of opportunity to spin out for 2,000 years now that men and women might hear of your love and have a stake in that future. Lord, have patience with us as we grope after things that are difficult for our minds to grasp, as we try and pierce the veil, as we try and imagine what that other world is like. And this world is so much with us. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Oh, Lord, help us to have that new dimension. Help us to live as those who have their feet on an eternal pathway. Help us to live as those who have no reason to be afraid of anything or anyone whose lives are secure in your hands. Help us to live as those who have a heavenly Father who's going to provide for everything we need so that we may be free from anxiety and have that serenity and poise that comes to those who know that they are your children. Grant us, O oh Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth this night and not to end our worship when we leave this building but may our lives bring glory to your name because we have met here through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The church has been in the world 2,000 years and the world's in as big a mess as ever it was, if not bigger. I don't know how many times people have said that to me. I'd be a rich man if I had a five pound note for every time that's been said. And the implication is that the church has been a noble experiment but a dismal failure. Now, of course, that very much depends on what you feel the church is for, what you feel it was intended or designed to do, and whether it has achieved that purpose. I was amused to hear of a wife who said to her husband one night, I don't think much of your new cutthroat razor. I've been trying to cut a piece of linoleum for the pantry all morning, and it just won't do it. Or the lady who said that the doctor had advised to have her to have an x-ray taken, which she had, and she said, it hasn't done me a bit of good. Now, the problem is that if you expect something which a thing was never in designed to do or achieve, you can't blame it for not achieving it. And I want to deal with two very common misunderstandings as to what the church is for. Because if people expect the church to do these two things, they're going to be disillusioned, disappointed, and they're going to think the church is a failure. The first is at the personal level and the second at the political. First of all, at the personal level, I meet many people inside as well as outside the church who honestly seem to believe that the church's job is to convert everybody on earth. And that our task will not be done until everybody in the world is a Christian. Now, of course, if you believe the church was intended to achieve that, then it has been a failure. And already millions have died without the church converting them. And they are beyond our reach, so we are never going to achieve that. But I do not believe that a day will ever come when every man and woman on earth is a Christian. I don't think the church was called to do that. And therefore, I'm not disappointed that this has not been achieved. There are millions of people who are converted, millions, but it's still a minority. And it may well always be a minority to the end of history. You see, when I ask Jesus what he says about this, I find that he clearly expected that the majority would not accept his way. Time and time again, he says, Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it, and many are on the other road. One day a man came to Jesus towards the end of his three years' ministry and said, Lord, are there few that be saved? In other words, how are you getting on with your mission? You're getting many converts. And Jesus said, just make sure that you're saved, brother. It's the only question you need bother about. For when the door is shut, many will be outside, and they'll want to get in then, and it'll be too late. And parable after parable assumes that there will be failure in preaching the gospel to many people. Take the parable of the sower. Out of five lots of soil, only one produces anything. 
stony, shallow, rocky, weedy, all kinds of soil. But the point is that from the good soil, the farmer gets enough to make the whole exercise worthwhile. And that's why Jesus told the parable of the sower. He said, you'll preach to this kind of person and you'll get nowhere. You'll preach to that kind of person and they'll get interested for a short time and then it'll evaporate. You preach to another kind of person, they're hard. But when you get into a good person, it's worth it all. You get a 60-fold, a 100-fold return. And that's why the farmer's sowing the seed. That's why I'm preaching tonight. I don't believe that there will ever come a day when everybody in Guildford's a Christian. But it's worth it when the seed soil falls in good soil. It's worth it. And if you get a harvest, you've succeeded, even if some of the seed was wasted. Now that's how Jesus talked. And therefore, unless we think that the church should by now have got everybody converted, the evangelization of the world in our generation, unless you believe that, you don't consider that it's a failure, that the church, even though it is millions, is still a minority. Now the second thing is this, the political effect of the church's presence. Again, many people talk as if by now the church should have taken over world government and should be running the whole show, even if it hasn't got everyone converted, it should have delivered us from war, famine, all the other things, disease, ignorance and the rest. As if the church's job is to cure all the problems of the world. And therefore they point to the hunger, to the disease, and say, there you are. And wars round the corner, the church is a failure. Only if Jesus told the church to stop these problems, but he didn't. And I do not believe that until Jesus comes back, these problems will be solved. He said so himself, there will be wars and rumors of wars right to the end. The church's job is not to stop war. He didn't tell us that. Mind you, the church has an amazing record of dealing with the sufferings of mankind. And if you'll only study it, you'll realize the record of the Christian church is second to none for helping people. You study the schools and the hospitals and the orphanages. You ask who started those. I'm sure you know the date 1066, don't you? Do you know the date 1084? That was the date the very first hospital in England was opened and it was a Christian who opened it. The Red Cross, the Boy Scouts, district nurses, these are things we take for granted as good movements, but they would never have started but for Jesus Christ and his church. And we need to remember this. And life in our factories and in our prisons and in our coal mines bears evident testimony to the effect of Christian influence in this land. But having said all that, I don't believe that the church is called to govern the world and to solve all its problems. It never will. We are called to relieve suffering, but we are not told that we will ever remove it. And therefore I'm not disappointed in the church if that doesn't happen. If either of these is hoped for, then there's going to be frustration and a sense of failure. Well, then what is the church really for? I would prefer to say, who is it really for? Because you can't answer the question, what is it for? But you can answer, who? Now, there are three basic answers. Concern with the three dimensions of love to which we are called. Number one, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The church is first to love God. It's for him. Second, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The church is for them. Third, and this was a new commandment that Jesus added to the other two, quite new but for all Christians, love one another. The th third purpose of the church, it is for us who know the Lord. The church is there to help people to love God, to love their neighbor, and to love their fellow Christians. And these are the three dimensions. Judged by this, he would be a bold man who said that the church had been a failure. Now let's take the first. The church is for God. 
That's why the world doesn't understand half the things we do. We're not doing them for the world, we're doing them for God. We don't care whether anybody else thinks they're good or helpful or not. If they're for God and He's pleased, then it's worth doing. Now I remember one of my earliest sermons in the early days when congregations put up with even worse than they have to face now. Uh, I preached on the text, You are a peculiar people. I got it straight from the authorized version of 1 Peter 2 and I thought what a great text. And I expounded it thus, said look at you all. Look at the oddities, the cranks, the way outs that we get in church. Isn't it marvelous that at least one society on earth has room for all the cranks? And so I went on, you see. And then I happened to look up the Oxford English Dictionary and I looked up the word peculiar. And it said that the real meaning of the word peculiar was this, belonging exclusively to. I thought, dear me, that sermon's got to go in the WPB and we must start again. And I went back to the text, you are a peculiar people and I realized that what Peter meant was, you belong to God, you're for him. You're not for anybody else, you're for him first. And therefore some of the things we do must seem awfully strange to people who don't believe in God and don't realize he's around and that you can do things for him. One of the great difficulties in Britain today is that everybody I think implicitly accepts that we should love our neighbor but they can't see the point of loving God. Indeed, there are even those who say that you can only love God by loving your neighbor as if they're two, one commandment, not two, but there are two. And the first duty of man is not to love his neighbor. That's the second. It's very important. But the first thing is to love God. Now, let me illustrate. There are two things that the church is concerned about that the world isn't bothered about. Worship and holiness. And you're only interested in those when you're for God. Now let's think of our worship. Here we are, we get inside a building, we sing hymns, we stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. We can't kneel here because the pews don't allow it. You can in the new building, we hope. But here we are, what are we doing? And people say, you know, if, if three or four hundred people would just go out and help people for two hours on Sunday, that would make the world a much happier place and be much more use. See, they don't realize what we're doing when we're here. Who do they think we're doing this for? We're doing it for God. Who are we singing to? We're singing to God. Of course we can hear each other, but we're singing for God. That's why we want to sing out for our best. He's listening. We're doing it for God. We're worshiping God. And I'm not really bothered about forms of worship and the outward paraphernalia of it. If we're doing it for God, then God doesn't look at the outside of a thing. He says, how much love is there in this? He doesn't really care if you're worshipping him in silence or banging a tambourine. He's saying, how much love is there in it? I had the privilege of taking a service this morning in an unusual way for me. Not an unknown, but an unusual. And starting by saying, dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and bewail and so on. And uh, it was very refreshing as a change. I don't think I could do it every Sunday. I'd become a parrot, but it was very refreshing. But you know, the real thing is not whether you use words or books or musical instruments. It's how much love there is in it. It doesn't really matter if it's terribly polished or terribly refined. You've got Christmas cards, so did we. Isn't it lovely when you get a card from your child? It's got horrible writing all over it. It's not nicely printed. It's got bits of pictures stuck on. You couldn't sell it in a shop. But it's got love in it. That's the important thing. And you value it. It's from my child. And he's done it himself or she's done it herself. And it means something to you. Or your son's first effort at woodwork. Well, you could fault it in dozens of places, but it's his and he did it out of love. The Lord doesn't say it must be just so and it must be like this. He says, how much is this my child saying, I love you, Dad? That's worship. I don't care what the form is. That's the reality of it. And when people wonder why we spend hours in church singing hymns, it's just because we're saying, God, you're worth a bit of our time. You would be worth more if we could give it. 
It always amazes me that in this country we've got into this funny habit of thinking that an hour must be the maximum for God. You go to Czechoslovakia and you find that they start at 2.30 and finish at 7. You see, what is the meaning of the word worship? It means worthship. It means you're telling God how much he's worth to you. Is he just worth half an hour? How much is God worth to you? What you put in the collection plate just now tells God how much you're worth to him. He's worth to you, I mean how much he's worth to you. You're declaring his worship, his worship. And you're saying, Lord, you're worth the best of my singing. You're worth this time. You're worth this money. I'd give more if I had it. That's worship. And the other thing is holiness. You see, again, the world isn't particularly concerned about holiness. The world doesn't like holiness. It laughs at it and says, huh, holy Joe. It's got a musty smell about it, but the word holy means godlike. Be ye holy, for I am holy, says God, meaning just be like me. Be a credit to your Father, so that people can look at you and say, aren't they a credit to their Heavenly Father? See your good works and glorify your Father in Heaven. You see, not only do I want my children to express their love to me, I want them to be a credit. I want to be proud of them. I want to be able to say, oh, I'm so glad I'm their father. I'm just proud to be their dad. And God is a heavenly father after whom every family on earth is named. And he says, be ye holy. I not only want the worship of your lips, I want the holiness of your lives, both together. I want you to live as my children ought to live. And the church is for God to worship with lips and to honor with life in holiness. And both together. In fact, one without the other is a bit offensive to God. This people honors me with their lips, said Isaiah, on behalf of the Lord, but their heart is far from me. And we began with a hymn that quoted a psalm, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. They go together. And the holiness of our lives will cause other people to praise God as the worship of our lips praises him. Now, as I've said, the world doesn't appreciate either of these. Worship is useless and holiness offensive to many people. But these are the two primary concerns of the church because we're for God. But the church is also for the world that is despising sometimes and indifferent at others to these holy things. And therefore I come to the second thing. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That means the church is for worship and holiness. Now, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the first could be done in a monastery. You could withdraw from the world and spend your days worshipping. I once went to live in a monastery to see what it was like. There were some very holy people there. Nine times a day we went into the chapel and we worshipped in Latin. And my Latin wasn't terribly good. But nevertheless, I tried to join in to get the feel of it, to try and see what it had. And you know, I found this, that after a few days, I was beginning not to want to see the world again. Now, I'm not saying it had that effect on others, but it had it on me. I thought, what a lovely place to stay. I'd like to stay right here. Never see that horrible world again. Stay in this garden behind this wall. And I remember I discharged myself before I'd fulfilled my promised stay. And I went back into the world. I just felt I had to. Now, that was just me, maybe. But a church that is monastic and that simply worships and goes to holiness conventions and forgets the world outside is forgetting the second dimension of the church's destiny. The church is the only society on earth, said someone, that exists primarily for its non-members. Well, there's a half-truth in that. Let's take that half-truth and look at it. Jesus used his hands for two things, to serve people and to save them. He used it with water to wash dirty feet and he allowed men to put nails through them. And these are the two things we are called to do for our neighbors, to serve them and to save them. Both, not one or the other, neither can be a substitute for the other. Both take service. The parable of the Good Samaritan is enough to tell you this. If you ever meet someone in need and you are in a position to meet that need, it doesn't matter who that someone is, you do something about it. Simple as that. It may be a hated Samaritan or Jew. It may be an enemy. 
It may be someone you don't like, someone you're not in speaking terms with. If you meet them in need and you can meet that need, you meet it. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus himself went about doing good. That's a lovely phrase. And if he calls us to follow him, we're to do the same. In our society, the physical needs of people are not so great. We live in the welfare state, in the affluent society, though there are still some who slip through the net. But there are social needs, there are lonely people, there are mental needs, a growing number of people with mental strain. And the kind of estrangement and burdens of which you heard earlier in the testimony. There are emotional needs. It may even include speaking out on political issues and even acting on them. But we are to meet men's needs. But if our duty to the world was limited to service to their needs, we would be treating them as less than men. If I care for a man's body and his mind and his emotions and stop there, I'm treating him as less than a man. Because according to the Bible, a man is someone who's made in the image of God and he has a dimension that must be met spiritually and a desperate need and people are crying out to have that need met even though they don't realize what's wrong. Study the pop songs, study the literature. Yesterday on children's television there was a blasphemous song sung by the new seekers. When there's no more love in Jesus, can you stand alone? They're singing that to the children on the television. And there's a spiritual need crying out there to be met. And therefore we dare not stop at service. Man does not live it by bread alone. We've got to move on to evangelism. Now that's a naughty word today. It's quite extraordinary how many react to this word as if it's sort of propagandizing, as if it's proselytizing, as if it's forcing someone against their will to do something. But evangelism as I understand it is this. It's to get people saved. Here is a quotation from a brilliant report by the bishops of the Church of England in 1945. They said to evangelize is so to present Christ Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit that men shall come to put their trust in God through him to accept him as their savior and serve him as their king in the fellowship of the church. That's a magnificent definition. And they were quoting a report produced in 1918. Twice after two world wars, there has been a report about the deepest need of England. And both times, conversion has been said to be the deepest needs. And both times, the reports have been put on the shelf. That report is called Towards the Conversion of England. And Archbishop Temple was one of the leading lights behind it. But it's just a report. The aim of evangelism is conversion. And we have the solemn task and sacred responsibility of converting people. Don't ever say that a man can't convert someone else to Christ. Of course you can. Every time the word convert is used in the Bible, the subject of the verb is human. It never says God converts people, it tells us to. Our job is to convert people to God. And the word convert means to turn them around and say, you're going that way, come this way. You're running away from God, come to him. You're running towards hell, try the road for heaven. And we are called to do this. If we are not converting everybody, that doesn't mean we're a failure. But if we are not converting anybody, we are a failure. You see, Christ sent us out not just to convert England, but the real task is not so much to convert everybody in the world, but he did say, go and convert somebody from every nation and every tribe and every kindred. It's God's plan to have in the church every nationality and every tongue. And until we've done that, our job is not finished. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations, then shall the end come. Charles Wesley puts it like this in a, a, a brilliant hymn. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and fit it for the sky. Now that last line brings me to the third purpose. The church is for us. 
It is the one place where we are to learn to love one another. You see, I don't just want my children to love me and me to love each one of them. I want them to learn to love each other and they're just going through that awkward stage when they get on each other's nerves. They're just finding their own life and so they're having to live together in the one house in turbulent adolescence or that's just on the horizon. And they're having their arguments and fights. But I want them to learn to love each other. I want us to be a family. Not just to love me and me to love them or my wife to love them and them to love my wife. I want them to love each other. And Christ wants us to love one another and to learn in the fellowship of the church how to do it. It's the school for Christians. And therefore there will be two things that the church will do under this heading. Teaching and fellowship. The word disciple means a learner, so I suppose in every church some of us could have a le an L plate back and front, and then a little later on, like cars, GB for getting better, back and front. We are learners. We're in God's school to learn. It takes a long time to learn to be a Christian. It takes a long time to learn to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You have a honeymoon period at the beginning of your Christian life, everybody does. God in his mercy puts you on a cloud and lets you float for maybe a few months. And then he says, now come on, we're going to learn. With the twelve apostles, it took three years full time to teach them to learn to love one another and to be his true disciples. It's going to take us years to learn. And there will always be the ministry of teaching in the church. As Jesus was called teacher more than anything else, though he was everything else, more people called him teacher than anything else, so the church must have a ministry of teaching. And it always has had. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. And he gave some pastors and teachers. The tragedy is that in so many churches you stop learning as a child. You've got teachers in the Sunday school, but you need teaching as an adult. And you can't be taught in five or seven minutes flat every Sunday. Teaching takes time. And Jesus called the twelve disciples to be with him for three years. And he talked to them all day as they walked, as they sat at meals. They heard him preach. He taught, taught, taught. Words, 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 but they were full of truth. And teaching must be a concern of the church if we're to love one another. But secondly, fellowship. Just as in a family there will be different ages and even different temperaments. In God's family there are different ages and temperaments. And there are four things we need to learn to do if we're going to have fellowship. One, we've got to get to know each other. You can't have fellowship if you don't know someone. Two, we must learn to share with one another. You can't have fellowship till you're sharing, giving and receiving financially, spiritually, socially. Thirdly, we need to learn to discipline one another. That's a deeper stage of fellowship. In a true family, there's discipline. And when you love one another enough to rebuke, to hold fast to what is good and hate what is evil, then you're having fellowship. Fourthly, then you will love one another, know each other, share with each other, discipline each other. These are the stages to loving one another. Well, in conclusion, these are the three purposes of the church. To love God, therefore we give time to worship and holiness. To love our neighbor, therefore we must give time and energy to service and evangelism. To love one another, therefore we must give time to teaching and to fellowship. Is the church a failure? Never. God alone knows how many millions have learned to love God and the world and each other through the church. Millions. And if there hadn't been a church of Jesus Christ, how would they ever have learned these three things? Guy gave his testimony tonight, but there are millions who could give their testimony and who could say that God had taken a useless life and filled it with meaning and purpose through love, loving the father, loving the brother, loving the neighbor. If the church fails to do these three things, there are two obvious reasons. First, the absence of the Holy Spirit. 
You cannot do the things of God without God. You cannot do any of these six things properly unless the Holy Spirit is there to help you. He is the vicar of Christ on earth. And what the spinal column is to the body, the Holy Spirit is to the church, communicating the head's control to every part of the body. How can you have a church without the Holy Spirit? Very simply, either by having too many people who aren't real Christians running it, or secondly, by having Christians who are what the Bible calls carnal, who are putting their trust in the flesh, in natural gifts rather than in the spirit. And the church will then fail to worship in spirit and in truth. It will fail to be holy because the Holy Spirit isn't there. It will fail to serve people. It will become self-centered. It will fail to evangelize and people won't get converted. It will fail to have true teaching and it will fail at the very point of fellowship. And the other reason why churches will fail is not only the absence of the Holy Spirit, but the presence of the evil one. You see, the world around us is in the grip of Satan. We know we are of God, and the whole world lieth in the grip of the evil one, says John. And the Satan from the world can invade the church just as the, the church can invade Satan's domain in the world. The invasion can cut both ways. And when the devil gets into the church, he will attack our love at every point I've mentioned. What will he do to our worship? He will make it terribly formal. He will make us concerned about the clothes we're wearing and the kind of music we're concerned about and, and the, the form of words and the liturgy and the ritual and all the rest of it. The devil loves religion. He hates Christianity. And so he'll make us the kind of church that has the form of godliness and goes through all the words and says, miserable sinners without your heart, feeling the shame of it. And what will he do to your holiness? Well, he'll knock it out of you and he'll substitute for it bourgeois respectability or middle-class morality, which he knows is offensive. He wants to take holiness away if he can, make us religious and respectable. Because if you're religious and respectable, you're not loving God. If you're loving God, you're worshiping and you're holy. What will he do to our service and evangelism? Well, he'll try and stop you doing it. If he can, he'll get the service out of your hands and into an unbeliever's hands so that he can then say, well, the humanist can do better than you can. What will he do to your evangelism? He'll tell you, just influence people. Don't talk to them about Jesus. The fisherman who came home one day and his wife said, did you catch many? He said, no, but I influenced a good few. And the devil would love us to be like that, just to influence people. But Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The devil wants to keep these little mouths shut if he can. Silent saints with foot and mouth disease. We won't speak and we won't go. Or if, he, if we are determined to go, then he'll make us so tactless and blundering that we'll put everybody off. We're not ignorant of his devices. And what will he do to teaching? He'll say, let's not have this dogmatic word of God. Let's have debate. Let's have dialogue. Let's have discussion. Let's have everybody's opinion. Let's have human philosophy. Let's mix it all up. And it sounds so much more exciting and it tickles the ears of those who want to hear some new thing, some new theology, some new Christianity. And what will he do to the fellowship? The devil will do one of two things to fellowship. He will either keep it so shallow that all you do together is have bazaars and cups of tea. Or if you're getting really deep, then he'll introduce division and suspicion and he'll break it up. The devil is against every one of the six things I've mentioned. And so we must finish by asking one question. How do you keep the devil out of the church and the Holy Spirit in? The answer is in one word. Prayer. Prayer. And to the six things I've mentioned to make the perfect number, I add a seventh. Worship, holiness, service, evangelism, teaching, Fellowship, prayer, prayer. And perhaps the most important thing in a church from this point of view is the meeting for prayer. You can test a church by that as readily as anything. 
do these people know that unless they pray the Holy Spirit is not present in power that if they ask the Holy Heavenly Father will so much more give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking and if they pray the devil can't get in Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees so that if you would be part of the Church of Christ then you are called to love God, to worship and holiness. You are called to love your neighbor and serve him and seek to win him for Christ, the greatest thing you could ever do for him. And you are called to love one another, to be taught and to have fellowship. And above all, you are called to pray and to pray and to pray. Let us pray. Father, last Sunday night we realized what a holy privilege it is to belong to your church. Tonight we realize what an awful responsibility it is. Without you we can do nothing, but with you all things are possible. O oh God, hasten the day when the gospel will have been preached to all the nations and the church will be gathered in, the harvest of the sowing of the seed of your word. And all kindred and tribe and tongue will gather around Jesus Christ to praise and to serve you forever and ever. Amen.